Hi, I'm George Pino, the CEO of Commercial Brokers International. Thank you for joining in today. Today, I got a great guest for all of you developers. And also, I think it applies, and the book that he wrote applies to a lot of real estate in general, especially agents. And it's the book itself is called Making It in Real Estate. And the gentleman, the author of that is John McNellis, a developer out of Palo Alto, California, who has uh, been successfully doing this for quite some time. Thank you for joining me, John. Thank you, George. My pleasure. Okay. You know, one of the things I loved about your book, um, number one, it's an easy read. <laughs> yeah. It's a quick and easy read. But more importantly, what I really uh, like about it is it is written for people who actually, I think, have maybe a little bit more intuition, a little bit more experience in the real estate game, so to speak, not just for the first time person, but really it's a lot of it is about perspective. And it's the really short chapters, two, three pages, but they cover a lot of the uh, ideas and a lot of the concepts that many starting developers and even real estate agents and or real estate investors overlook. And uh, because of that, I think I absolutely loved it because it's a quick read. I am definitely going to be recommending it. By the way, anybody uh, check our uh, library for links to the book itself. And we'll make sure that, uh, you know, I, I'm telling you right now, I don't read that many books that I really like this much. <laughs> and uh, there it is. There it is. So, you know, one of the over, but, the, one of the George, concepts. Uh, yeah, let me, let me just, you raised an excellent point. I wrote that book for a smart 30 year old, you know, somebody who's been in our business in yeah. real estate for seven, eight years, uh, and who's a broker, a banker, an architect, an engineer, or in my case, a lawyer who wants to shift over into you know, the, the top of the food chain is, is development, of course. Uh, and so it, as, as it turns out, the book has become a textbook at colleges. And so kids who have no experience read it, but that wasn't the intended audience. You, you hit on it exactly. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's should I do a career change? And what I'm trying to say in the book is, Maybe, maybe not. You know, development is really hard. Most people fail at it. Maybe you should keep your day job and do the development on the side. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And I think, you know, I think one of the key things that uh, I think maybe may have been missing a little bit in the book was the developer mindset. The And, and developers, like you said, are, I think are considered top of the food chain when it comes to the real estate industry. And part of that is because it's a very unique mix of both uh, art and science in that they see concepts that are uh, something that is in need, uh, almost like a field of dreams uh, from the movie way yeah. back when, where I will build it and they will come. And the successful developers have a really good idea of what the people want and they can understand that and they can forecast into the future and be able to develop that. Um, at the same time, though, a lot of developers don't have that and they go into the mindset of, um, what I used to say, uh, the developer's mindset of, uh, you know, every baby is absolutely beautiful to their mother. <laughs> and, uh, you know, every development's absolutely beautiful for the developer, regardless of the, all the negatives it has. And they may not see that. And a lot of developers starting off get fall into that trap a little bit, building for themselves rather than building for the community. And, uh, you know, I know you covered that part of it a little bit as well, but what are some of the aspects of a developer personality wise that you think really attribute to your success? You know, I, I think development is all about both taking risk and properly assessing it. You know, uh, there are, and, and I think I, I kind of jokingly make the point in the book, in my experience, lawyers tend to be a lot smarter than their developer clients, but that they make a tenth as much, and it irritates them because the lawyers don't have that ability, George, to take risk. You know, all, all they they see a forest of risk and they say, "I'm not going to do it." And a, a sharp developer says, "Yeah, I understand that these are risks, but this is these twenty that the the lawyer has raised." Only two or three of them are real risks, and here is how I will uh, take care of those. So one is the willingness to take risks, and the other, <laughs> the ability. So some people have that, and they, they go into development in a blaze, and they blow up because they'll take the risk, but they can't handle them. The, the other part is you know, accurately assessing that risk and, and uh, you know, doing everything you can to tamp it down. Yeah, uh, and, and I think also, you know, to your point, 
a lot of attorneys that do work, you're right. They make about one tenth or so of a successful developer. Um, what's interesting though, is that I think that attorneys are built and trained to think of the negative and they think of the right. worst outcomes and everything. And that really mm -hmm. plays toward their uh, risk aversion. And while a developer, a lot of times is looking at the upside, the optimistic, a little bit more of a sunny, so to speak. I'm not saying all developers walk around with rose colored glasses because we know that's not true. Uh, but I think that they do bring some optimism that is key to having uh, a developer mindset when it comes to building something. Cause you really, like I said, you have to forecast into the future. Um, one of the th key things that really um, hit me in the book was a lot of what you're talking about on the perspective side when it comes to, and, and I thought a lot of the book was actually just perspective. Uh, but a lot of it was perspective in uh, how you look at real estate agents, um, how you look at the brokers and your team, uh, building a team around yourself that you can trust, that you're loyal to, that you work well together. And I think a lot of people don't realize that there's so much value in that. Uh, but also when it comes to building that team, um, that you don't want to shortchange them so to speak or cut cut your nose off to spite your face or you know there's so many analogies tripping over penny uh you know tripping over dollars to pick up pennies things like that and you see that often with developers either trying to uh broker themselves or they're trying to cut the commissions not realizing that's not going to happen uh as well because i mean let's face it we're all astute investors or the people who are buying uh, uh the properties or developing them are relatively astute and if your developer's not paying a co-op fee um, or they're not sharing the co-op fee, then that's just going to, most astute investors are either going to calculate that into what they overall pay and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but ultimately it could hurt them because it may not be the best that someone's willing to pay if they have to wash out of it and just the mindset itself. And I really love that, that you're really bringing those arguments to the table of what a developer should take into consideration, not just the numbers itself, but the interpersonal relationship and the team management. Um, how has that really worked out for you? And I'm sure it has in the long run itself. I'm sure you've created some very good relationships. And just from reading of your book, sounds like even some friendships uh, through some of your team members. Uh, George, it, so the biggest player in my goodness, so our expertise in neighborhood shopping centers, 100,000 foot center, Safeway, Walmart, you know, 10 acres, Bank of America, McDonald's, and so on. And we've been doing that for nearly four years. Uh, the biggest competitor that we have in our space is Regency Centers, which is the yeah. largest. It's a publicly traded REIT. So all of, they have, it, it, I'm guessing, but they have inside architects, inside engineers, inside leasing agents, property managers, and so on. The way that a, a small shop like mine can compete, because we don't have any of that. We, mm -hmm. uh, all of that is outside, but we've worked with the same title companies, the same brokers, the same architects, contractors. So when someone comes up with a new deal for me, do I bid it out among three contractors and do I go through each line in the contract, you know, the way a, a big firm would do and, and go back and forth with that contract for weeks? No, we get the same damn contract. Okay, it worked last year for this $7 million deal. Change the amount, change the address, we're good to go. And I constantly make the point that uh, you're a fool if you're a developer, if, if you're trying to represent yourself. The brokers see all the deals. The brokers, are, the only deals you're going to see without a broker are the crap deals that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can think that, oh, I'm going to save half the commission and my investors are going to think I'm a great guy, but you're not going to get any good deals. You know, the Georges of the world <laughs> are, are going to say, no. <laughs> So, uh, in fact, we have, again, to, to compete with the regencies of the world, we have told brokers, look, get your full commission from the seller, but you find us a deal, a good deal that, that we like, we'll put you in for 5% of the deal on the backside, you know, after a return of our capital. You know, clear it with the seller, or we tell them to clear it with the seller, hopefully they, they, they do. But... That's something that no big company can do. Yeah. And that's that's an enormous financial incentive. And we've probably done that a dozen times. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Out of our, our 30 plus projects, and we probably have a dozen, you know, let's call them finders, mm -hmm. uh, guys who do really no more for us than say, hey, John, 
you ought to buy this old broken down shopping center because uh you know that the seller's desperate you know walmart wants to go in or, or whatever there's always if there's an inside track to it we say yeah we like that deal we say okay george you got your commission and you're in the deal too mm -hmm. and that that makes us enormously competitive yeah. against so I, it, you know it, it's like we're a little absolutely. mammals scurrying around among the big dinosaurs <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I do my own uh, investing. I do ACK Rehab uh, on the development side. We've syndicated a few deals, but also, I mean, the one thing I learned from day one, I don't represent myself either on the acquisition or the disposition. Right. I'm always hiring a broker in the marketplace that is fully aware of what's going on, what's happening, and especially if we're going into a market that maybe we're not as familiar with, um, relying on the local expertise. And then um, I can tell you that as a broker, I'm constantly offering, uh, you know, I'll throw my commission in on the investment side. Go ahead. Sure. And uh, surprisingly, a lot of investors don't want it or developers don't want it because they don't need it. Right. Uh, but, you know, the ones that uh, we have good relationships with, we have definitely worked it. And I can tell you that they're usually the first ones we go to uh, because of that, because there's, you know, I... I'd rather, and even if it's not a bonus, so to speak, but rather, you know what, I'll take my whole commission and just throw it in either on the LP side or GP side, as long as the money's pari passu, we'll work it out and figure out what yeah. to do. And, yeah, we've allowed that, you know, yeah. invest your whole commission in it. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll give it for free. You, know, you, yeah. you take you take your $100,000 commission and you've got 5% on yeah. the backside. The other thing we'll do, we almost invariably know a, a the first day we look at a property, whether we intend to keep it long term yeah. or whether we're going to get in, get out, make the surgical repairs to it and sell it. And if we're going to do the, the latter, if we're going to sell, then we'll say, OK, George, you've got your commission going in. You also have the commission going out, you know, so you, you know you have that deal. And and would be developers out there. I recommend that to you every time mm -hmm. that what you want to do is get the best possible broker in the area where you want to develop in the expertise, you know, whether it's industrial, retail, or, or what have you. But you, you want to find the best guy in that location, and you want to make him your best friend. <laughs> and, and, it, and you're right, back to your earlier point. A lot of these guys, I've been working with uh, some brokers for the better part of 40 years. Yeah. And so there's, there's a, this vast reservoir of trust, uh, you know, so we don't dick around with listing agreements and all that. Again, it's just, let's get the deal done. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, we, we definitely have clients like that that we appreciate and we know that we can just pick up the phone and trust them and go to, um, you know. And and before we go into a little bit, I want to go. I want to touch another thing in the book that I really enjoyed or or liked, and that was actually probably your key takeaway that you put down, um, and that's the net to me NTM. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and the reason why I say that is, you know, I, I do a lot of training with uh, real estate, commercial real estate agents as well. And one of the first things I say to them is, what's your time worth? Your time as a real estate agent is your most valuable asset. What is your time worth? How much are you looking to make? If you're going to make, if you want to make $200,000 a year in your pocket, that's equivalent of, uh, what is that, 110 or so dollars an hour or so, or um, that they oh, have to make. Sure. And uh, so because of that, look at your time and your cost. What are you doing? Is this deal worth the, you know, or, or using an I, I like analogies as well, or, or um, uh, you know, is, is the juice worth the squeeze? And, right. uh, you know, I like that as well, because I do see that a lot of developers and agents and other businesses just chase the deal without really understanding that, you know, and they get so invested in it, they get so emotionally tied to it that they want to make it happen and it ends up happening. I fell into that trap way back. Uh, this was uh, a 392 unit apartment building that we were purchasing and we took it to market uh, for our, we we're opening it up to our syndicators and uh, it was two days before the stock market crashed in uh, 2008. Ouch. <laughs> now in two days, I sold 85% of the uh, uh, spaces. And it was, it looked uh, to be such a good deal that we just kept going and going and going. We actually ended up closing that deal that year, um, not till December. It took us about another month and a half to fill the other 15%. <laughs> um, but, you know, frankly, I think we probably should have retraded a little bit more, done a little bit more, gone in or, or something along those lines. Um, 
but you know, overall, we still got a good deal. We still got in into it. Um, and you know, I, I don't looking back though, was it worth the amount of time and money that we spent into it overall? Probably not. Right. And, and it's amazing the number of professionals and, and seasoned guys such as ourselves who, who at the end of a 10 year development deal, they make wages and, and you, you say to them, you know, if you could actually parse the numbers correctly in the beginning, you know, between the inside financial partner, the outside financial partner, and all the costs, you would have realized that you're not going to make very much money. So, yeah, the, the NTM, as I call it, would, <laughs> is what's the net to me? What am I going to get yeah. out of this? Uh, and you really taking a hard look at that on day one will make you. And, and we, we've all done it. I said, wow, I worked on that deal for five years and, and I made less than the leasing agents on it. Now that happens. You know, and the other point I, I make throughout the book is sooner or later, you're, if you're going to do more than a, a handful of deals in real you're, estate, you're going to lose money. Yeah. But back to 2008, if, if you were the son of, of Albert Einstein or Bill Gates and you were doing deals in 2008, you still lost money because the thing has collapsed. Mm -hmm. Or... Uh, COVID came from out of nowhere and, and guys lost a ton of money. There, there's just too many variables that we can't control in the business. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, that's one of the things I also, and I think you, you mentioned that in the book too, is don't really focus or concentrate on the, the variables that you can't control, but there are those that you can control to mitigate the risk of those variables coming to life. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's something that's not taught in school a lot. Um, and, and it's not taught in the general world a lot. It's just something that you pick up with experience. Um, partnerships, uh, you know, I know you talk about partnerships, getting in and out of partnerships a little bit in the backside of the book. Um, and, you know, one of the things I love about the book is, you know, I, I said it was an easy read. Um, but, you know, for me, it's also almost, um, uh, in my marketing life, I was taught way back when to, you know, you give them enough to make them interested and they come back for more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of the concepts that you're going over are very high level, but don't really necessarily go into kind of what you, and I love that part of it because it's very much, um, it's not biased in one way, shape or another. It's just a, you know, and I can see why it would be picked up as a textbook because of that. Um, but you know, partnerships, um, how, what do you feel about buy-sell agreements and things like that? Do you think they should all have them uh, going yeah. into it? I know you didn't really even mention, you know, you talked about being tied into it as a negative, but, you know, how can you mitigate that negative? All right. What do I think about buy-sell agreements? And the joke, <laughs> I, you know, I do a lot of talks, and the joke I've made is that the one advantage partnerships have over marriages usually is that you can plan for the divorce in advance. You know, you and by that, I mean, you could put call, you could call it a put call, a shotgun option or a buy sell, but I wouldn't do a, a deal today without one. So yeah. I had a partner, you know, and when I, I started in my late twenties and, and in your late twenties, I, I guarantee you, it's very hard to sell a, a, a big development project. I had an older partner who I couldn't sell myself, but I could sell him. And the guy was an accomplished uh, shopping center developer, which is how I fell into the business. But our partnerships, George, you might as well have just taken a handshake and put your hands on a fax machine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they were it, like two pages long, 50-50. And as it turns out, uh, and he's a good enough guy, but we didn't see uh, eye to eye on a lot of things. We broke up, so to speak, oh God, in by the early 90s. But I was stuck in deals that he didn't want to sell because there was no buy-sell. Mm -hmm. if, if Folks, if you're... <laughs> If you're going to do a partnership, make sure you have a way out of it. Uh, yeah. And it, it could be that, you know, you're the one, uh, you get divorced, your, your wife wants half your money, so somebody dies, or your financial partner. Now, if you don't have any money, the problem with a buy-sell is the guy who has more money is, has a huge advantage mm -hmm. uh, in a buy-sell. You know, they call it a shotgun option, but if you don't have some shells, it, it can be kind of tricky. But uh, as a young developer, I would expect it from the the, the money side that, that there would be a buy-sell, and, and I would agree with it right away. Yeah. No, uh, I, you have to start partnerships. And, and another one of my uh, sermons is, you, 
unless you're born rich, and, and I certainly wasn't, uh, you have to start with other people's money. So you you need to start in partnerships, but yeah. we evolved away from them uh, by the time, and I'm sure you read it in the book, by the time the early 90s came around, we gave up having financial partners. And, and the decision what was pretty simple, which was I'd rather own 100% of a million dollar deal, a, a McDonald's or a gas station, than uh, 1% of a $100 million deal. You know, mm -hmm. So that the guys, that, that all the young guys envy, the guys who build the towers in, in Los Angeles or San Francisco or wherever, wow, you say, gee, that, that guy's the owner of that huge project. But he's got an infinitesimal share, all kinds of partners, all kinds of risk involved. And, uh, and particularly today, the office market is crushed. But uh, you have no control. You know, real estate's illiquid enough already. But mm -hmm. if, if I own a, a, a McDonald's, say, like, I think of it like a $100 chip. <laughs> you know, you can sell it any time. You can throw it in the table. Uh, but if, if you're a minority partner with a big financial institution on a large project, you're stuck. And th they may want to sell at the bottom of the market. They usually do because they're idiots. <laughs> or yep. uh, and you're saying, please don't sell. Or at the top of the market, and this has happened to friends of mine, George, uh, the, I had great guys who had a $2 billion fund. 2006, they wanted to sell. And the, the, the state teacher's pension fund, I won't mention which one, looked at the numbers. And the, the bureaucrats at the, the pension fund said, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys are making too much money. <laughs> you know, was, Let's say they were going to make, I'll, I'll make a number. They were going to make 10 or $20 million. But the financial partners, you know, you know, dug in their heels and they couldn't sell it. And of course, the crash came along. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, so at this point in our career, we don't have uh, at this point, last 30 years, we don't have financial partners at all. Uh, we do smaller part, smaller deals with 100 percent of our own capital. Nice. Nice. No, I, and um, I definitely think that's the way to go uh, for myself if I was in your shoes as well. Uh, I tend not to be one that likes partnerships uh, other than the bit my, I've been business partners with my business partner since 93. Uh, right. I started investing. Uh, I was, I think 27, 28. And uh, it's uh, just like you said, our original agreement was a handshake and, you know, <laughs> it, and it was that way until we started syndicating deals and the banks and lenders and attorneys started yelling at us. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then we started to think, because, you know, when you're young, you don't think about what happens 20 years from now. Um, you're thinking, I'm bulletproof. I'm doing this. I'm building this for my future. And it's going to, you know, my future is always going to be there. But you don't realize that life happens. And right. I think that's part of what, you know, your whole book is all about. Uh, managing the risks that life happen that you can actually control, I think. Um, you know, that's well put. That's out there. Right. And, and to be succinct, but it's more about you can't manage the risks if you don't understand where they are or identify them ahead of time. And that's why I think this is a great roadmap. Now, speaking of roadmaps, you know, we're, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to take out, uh, I'm going to ask you to do something that, uh, I, as a broker, say all the time, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm hoping you do. I saw it. <laughs> Thanks. All right, George, I'm here in Silicon Valley. I've been here forever. Did I invest in Google? No. Amazon? No. NVIDIA? No. <laughs> so uh, my, my crystal ball it is more like that, you know, the, the little magic eight ball, you know, that you, you shake. You yeah. know, and so, so yes, no, maybe. Uh, but anyway, it, with, with that as a proviso, I'm happy to prognosticate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think the best way to prognosticate and kind of, uh, you know, uh, as the old saying goes, put your money where your mouth is. Where are you developing now? What are you developing? What are you looking to do? And I know your 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 realm is uh, two hours uh, a two hour drive from San Francisco, which is a huge territory um, without traffic, but. <laughs> It's still, you know, it, it, as far as demographically speaking, I mean, you're going all the way up to Napa Plus uh, and then all the way down, you know, uh, past Paul. You have some great 
density, all, especially if you go east, everything going out in the Modesto neighborhoods um, right now with Lathrop and all the development that you're seeing out there. I mean, first of all, there's a dearth of retail in Lathrop. It really needs it desperately. I was out there, take a look around uh, with a developer client, and uh, I was surprised at how much retail was not there. Uh, but um, you know, I know that's a master plan and they're kind of controlling that part of it. So, but where are you looking at for yourself and your company? All right. So here are the cards on the table. The last three development deals uh, that I tied up and worked on for several years, uh, one was ground up dirt uh, and two were uh, not renovations, major rehabs of, of existing empty centers. I flipped all three. Uh work on for a couple of years, put a couple, the highlight of, of 2023, I had a deal that had been in escrow on out in the Valley for several years that as far as I was concerned, and no, I'll, I'll tell you exactly. At the end of the day, it was invest $8 million. And if everything went well, maybe make seven, 800,000. I, I said, if, if I was interested in it to, to build it and sell it, uh, I sold it to uh, a group that wanted to keep it, and, and I was worried about uh, cap rates. So the group I sold it to, or basically flipped it to with, with the seller's approval, was a construction company. So that they had the construction risk covered, and they wanted to keep it long term. Uh, I still, I think today, just to cut to it, the only thing in my base world, which is retail, that makes sense to build is ground up, ground lease, drive-through restaurants. The yeah. Those still pencil. I'm working on a couple of those in the Valley with uh, Chick-fil-A. And, and those uh, they are tricky to get approved, tricky to get done, but they work. Uh, yeah. As far as I know, any new shopping center constructions, you know, the classic bar bill, 100,000 foot center, at least in California, you know, in my backyard, they are not working. Uh, and all the smart guys that, that I respect uh, are are sitting on their hands, scratching their heads, saying, what are we going to do? The development deals don't work. Mm -hmm. I have a younger partner that I do um, very high-end condominiums, uh, small, here in Palo Alto. And, and Palo Alto is an anomaly. It's, it's, mm -hmm. because it's such a wealthy town. Uh, believe it or not, condos sell for 2,000 a foot. Uh, and those work. So we have just a few blocks from my office. We've got... Uh, called a fourplex of, of condos under construction. Small project, very, very expensive, but it should make a little bit of money, you know, thanks to the prices yep. here. And that's really it. Uh, okay. And well, you know, I, I think uh, I think a lot of people are actually jumping on that STNL world uh, with you as well right now. Uh, you know, the STNL the market itself, it seems especially on the QSR side, one of the strongest ones out there, um, especially if you can get a company along the lines of Chick-fil-A, which trades at such a low cap rate um, coming in. So it's really going to boost the margins that you can potentially have on the build out and then selling it. Um, so are you focusing on your QSR specifically on maybe the top five or so tier type tenants? Um, or are you just, look, you know, there are obviously needs. And I think in the top five in the QSR for uh, for QSRs is probably going to be Raising Cane's, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's. Uh, uh, you have a couple of outcomers out there right now. But even, you know, so are, are you looking at the top tier only, the ones that are trading at the lowest cap rates uh, for whatever reason? Or, you know, is it more along the lines of, you know, this is, tell me what goes into your development process. Um, I, I think I know, but I wanted to ask is more about, um, or do you look at a property and say, you know, here's the best tenant I think is going to fit here based upon our um, uh, analysis and uh, um, the, because of that, here's who, you know, and then you talk to them ahead of time before you even go and really close on the, on the, uh, property itself or do you go after the property with the vision of this is a great property with these demographics these traffic counts these traffic generators and as such i know i can backfill this with chick-fil-a in and out you know definitely not whataburger up in your neck of the woods but <laughs> yeah. um or or uh um you know uh, mcdonald's 
All right. But first, George, I, I'm going to confess, and uh, this is a secret, so don't share it with all your listeners, but you're giving me way too much credit. Uh, <laughs> at, 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 at this point in my career, a deal basically has to hit me on the nose with a two by four. Uh, and by that, I mean someone like you, some a smart guy that I respect, has to call me and say, hey, John, here's the deal. Uh, and, and somebody did you know, the um, six months ago. Here's the deal. In this woebegone town, this guy who owns this two-acre piece is in trouble. He needs to dump this piece. And here's the solution. It's Chick-fil-A. And, and so I said, oh, okay. And it's it's back of the envelope math. And, and if it, I, and that's you know, so I'm not actively looking for deals. You know, deals kind of find me at this point, mm -hmm. okay. which is a yep. is a good thing. It's a good uh, thing. It's a good and thing. And then to, to your other point, uh, and this is an interesting one. It's historically, it, it, if someone says, "Here's a," so the one I just described, it, it's a problem and solution all in the same. Empty land, put Chick Fil A in, sell it, right? That's a set piece, easy. Uh, those are, and you can say yes, no, uh, and the chances of getting the, the deal done are 80%, and I'll do it. Uh, where I think you make the most money, but it's, again, back to risk, is the other way, which is here is a great piece of property. You know, it's at the corner of no and brainer, you know, and it's just, but we don't know, and we've got to close on it in 30 days, and we don't know who's going to go there. If, you bring me that piece of property and I look at it, I say, wow, this is, geez, it sits right on top of Highway 80, say, or, or Highway 5. This is a great piece of property. Then what I would do is I would ask around, and if I had multiple exits, if, if there were only one, and this has happened before, if, if the only solution to this deal is, say, Walmart, you know, if, if Walmart goes, it's great. If they don't go, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to do that yeah, deal. No. I, I, I don't want to go down a tunnel with one exit. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, and, and we've done really well with this, wow, this old center, we can renovate it and we can put in all kinds of, of tenants or this piece of land, this is a killer piece. Uh, if there are two, three possible exits or solutions to it, then yeah, we'll buy the dirt. It's, you know, my joke lately when young brokers call me, uh, uh, they say, what are you buying? I said, well, I want to buy something that uh, if I were found out the price, you know, I'd be arrested for grand theft. You know, so I, I want to get a, a really hell of a good deal. And thus far, you know, they're, they're, the good deals, I think, are few and far between. There's still too much money on the sidelines. Uh, and I, I don't know what you're seeing, but uh, again, my development friends that are not seeing many deals, you know, at, We've got a couple going, but it's, it's it's a tough time right now. Yeah, no, definitely a tough time. There's a, uh, and, and to your point, there is a lot of money sitting on the sidelines. It's, uh, you know, trying to find the right deals. And, and I think a lot of that is uh, timing uh, with the fog of what is going to happen in the, in the immediate uh, six months to one year um, when it comes to the uh, – election interest rates things along those lines but also i think we're still coming out and trying to feel and figure out exactly what works i think uh you know from the pandemic days um but i think as we go along life is again becoming back to normal and you know i think uh what we're finding is that everything that we were doing before for the most part 80 90 percent of it was right on track it's just now getting back to human nature to get them comfortable to come in um, the one last thing I'm going to ask you is because I know a lot of people that are going to watch this or look at this is they're going to say, you know what? I want to be a developer. What do I, what, you know, and, and what is this? Uh, and, uh, what, as far as one trait, if you could boil it down to one trait and I, I'm going to tell you, uh, we, there's a pretty famous developer that we work with here and in his boardrooms, uh, in LA, he has in like 12 inch brass letters, two words, relentless per persistence. And, you know, he says that is probably the main thing for developers that they need to have because you're running into so many roadblocks and things like that. Now, if you were to try and boil it down to a trait that you think is crucial for any developer to have, what do you think that would be? 
Yeah, you, you could just drop the adjective and just call it persistence. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you need a thick skin. You have to get very used to uh, not having your phone calls returned. Mm -hmm. You have to realize that you're often going to encounter active resistance uh, from the neighbors mm -hmm. uh, who, who don't want to see the property developed. You know, they like their free park or from the city that that uh, has a vision of <laughs> that's absolutely economically absurd for the property. Uh, at best, you tend a city to with that. No, Come on, yeah. I'm sorry. I couldn't. Yeah. You know, at, at best, you kind of encounter benign indifference. And they would say, yeah, OK, yeah, we don't care. Mm -hmm. So you've just you cannot it just, yeah, you can't take no for an answer. Uh, you have to you just have to keep you know, plugging away at it. But part of it, though, with development, you know, we're all salesmen and what a developer rather than it, it tends to be selling himself you know, when they're young. You know, you're selling yourself to the seller. You say, look. Your property, this farm is worth a million dollars, but if I can get it rezoned over the next two years to, to put in my shopping center or my office building, it, it's going to be worth a lot more than that. If you'll give me two years uh, I, I can, and you know, I'll pay you a little bit along the way, I'll pay you a million five. So you, you need salesmanship. Developers who don't have that, <laughs> developers who are, let's call it, uh, charismatically charmed, charismatically uh, incapacitated, I guess, it, it's really tough. So you, you need to be able to sell uh, and you need to be persistent and you need to be pretty good with basic arithmetic. <laughs> and, and beyond that, um, risk analysis, you know, it, yeah. again, I, I've seen... <laughs> You know, people have told me I've had uh, three sets of three different lawyers over the years say, you know, John's not that smart. Uh, if he can do it, I can, too. You know, uh, and then they say, hey, John, can we use an empty office and, and, you know, we'll be developers, too. And they keep back to my earlier point. They see that force of risk you know, and they just can't pull the trigger. They just say, oh, my God, you know, that. That there's a toxic spill a half a mile away, you know, maybe it's on this property and, and they, they can't get it done. So you need to be able to, to, to swallow hard, sign a guarantee that you don't want to sign. And, and your wife or your husband is going to say, oh, my God, you know, if this goes wrong, if we can be wiped out. Almost never happens, but you've got to accept risk and, and then correctly assess you know, how realistic it is and, and what you're going to do to avoid it. Yeah, but yeah, persistence. I, I I would buy that. Okay, great. Well, you know, I I want to say thank you very much for your time. I kept you quite some time. We're about a half hour in, and That's fine. Uh, John, I appreciate your time. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Again, uh, the book out there is making it in real estate, starting out as a developer. There you go. Yep, there you go, and it's available on Amazon. But you know, again, although it is a short easy read um i think there's a lot to take back on it and it's more than itself it's more about creating that thought process and the conversations and the questions that come to mind um and that's why i i, I actually really enjoyed this book i haven't i haven't said that in a long time john i, I really Thank you. It. and in fact uh you know it, it's uh one of the books the other books i love the most which kind of ties in a little bit as this as well and about the same size is a book that was written in the 60s um, that still required reading in a lot of uh, business schools. Um, that was how to lie with statistics. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, it's not like you're lying, you know, because everyone says numbers don't lie. And I think you cover that in this book as well um, about, you know, numbers don't lie, but your assumptions can give you false information. And, you know, that that's always been, that was one of my learning curves early on, you know, when I was 30, 20 something years old, looking at the OMs and you're like, Oh wow, this is great! Wait, how are we how are they supposed to get that kind yeah. of increase? What are they going to do with that? Uh, um, yeah, and and you look at it and you're like, wow, these people are just going to be out of business in a couple of years um, with these assumptions, and you see that over and over. So you know, I, I do appreciate it. I do uh, really did uh, enjoy this book, and uh, for all you out there, um, if you haven't done so yet, please subscribe and hit the like bu button if you liked it, and we'll have all the contact or the book information uh down below for john and uh 
again, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, one final thing. The book actually came out, I, I write a monthly real estate column. Uh, it was for the Registry Magazine, and now it's for the San Francisco Business Times. And, and the book actually was born gradually over years, out of, which is one reason the chapters are so short, George, because it, it came out of a series of columns that I'd written yep. uh, in a paper. If It, it reads if, very much like that. It's nice. It's actually, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, folks, if, if you want to, send me an email at john at mcnellis.com. john at mcnellis.com. I'll send you back. You can sign up for these uh, newsletters or essays, yep. as I call them. And, uh, you know, I, I actually, the next one, which I'll finish this morning, is on uh, City of Palo Alto is crazy, just like so many of these liberal cities. Uh, you can quote me on this. It wants to uh, put a vacancy tax on us, uh, commercial landlords, on spaces yeah. that we can't lease. San Francisco has done it. Washington, D.C. has done it. It's just a terrible idea. Yeah, but a couple anyway. municipalities, I was going to say, are already in that process and have already done so, but it's... Yeah. The, sometimes the thinking, it's more about getting votes than it is about the actual neighborhood and, and improving it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, totally counterproductive. But anyway, yep. if, if you want to read my stuff, johnmcnellis.com. And, and if you do read the book, drop me a note. I always love to hear from you folks. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Thanks, George.